All right, so um, everybody here, I'm, uh, I'm Corian Bast. I'm the actually the product and solutions marketing manager at ITPreneurs. Uh, at ITPreneurs, we develop courseware and, um, and facilitate other processes for IT training companies. Um, and today we're going to discuss the topic, uh, 10 common IT management mistakes and how to solve those with COVID and also COVID training. Uh, many of you will know Gary Hardy. He will be speaking today uh, as well as uh, Stefan Brendel. Uh, so Gary Hardy, yeah, he's the COVID author. Uh, internally, we call him Mr. COVID because he's been in the industry for so long. And we're yeah, very glad to have him on board. I have a long hi history with Gary, so it's always fun to have uh, to join a webinar. Um, Stefan, he's the regional manager at EMEA for APMG. Well, anybody who has anything got to do with COVID will also know APMG, um, especially, or I, say, I should say APMG International. And Stefan will provide some insight on uh, the COVID figures, uh, the growth, and also yeah, perhaps some of the things to position COVID a little bit better. Mm -hmm. So Gary, I think that's uh, all from my side. Uh, we already covered some of the, uh, uh, to see if you can hear and see the slides and you guys responded already, so thanks for that. So I'll, I'll skip that one. I do have one poll question just uh, to see what kind, to give Gary and myself an idea of uh, who we have here. So hang in with me while I select the poll question. Uh, just wanted to see how familiar you are with, uh, with COVID. So I'm just going to launch this poll here. If you can just answer that one. So are you already offering COVID training courses or consulting based on COVID? And this topic today is it's it's geared towards the people who kind of already offer COVID, do something with COVID. But if you're new to COVID, it's still a very relevant presentation. So about so that's interesting for, for uh, Gary and Stefan. About 63% says yes, uh, already do something, and 38% says no. So I will close the poll. Uh, I can actually share it with you so you can kind of get an idea. So here are the results. Thanks again for answering that. And then I'll close that one again in a second. Hide. Then I have one more to go, and then we'll um, actually let Gary actually speak. Sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so what's your role within the organization? Also an interesting one for us to know. And perhaps we can, um, yeah, if there are things, Gary, Stefan, that you can uh, take away from this to make it more specific. So, okay. The good news is that, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to say we have no salespeople on the call, but no, actually, that's, uh, that's a joke. That, so the majority is the trainer and management and consultants. All right, closing the poll in three, two, one. 82% voted. I'll take it. Close. Share. Here we go. So that's kind of the breakdown. So a lot of trainers, uh, a lot of consultants uh, believe the right audience uh, to do something with COVID. And uh, so we'll close the poll. Gary, you're all up. I'll close this now. Yep. Hi. And I'll go back to my slides. And then, um, yeah, everybody will get a recording and the slides of this session. So, Gary, it's all you. Thanks, Corinne. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's. Uh Great to see all the people from around the world here. Look, and I hope this is going to be a bit provocative, perhaps, and also thought-provoking in terms of um, handling some questions from you guys around this, this thinking. So, look, what I'm going to do is just run through 10 topics that I just find from my experience to be, um, well, issues, but also challenges that I find prevent IT being applied, you know, in a positive sort of fashion. And, and from a COVID point of view, where COVID really tends to drive certain um, you know, key improvements. And it'd be interesting to know whether or not you agree with me, frankly. Um, uh, we'll perhaps deal with that towards the end of the session. So, Corinne, let's go to the first one. And what I'm going to do is just talk over each, each topic and then just refer quickly to where in COVID this is relevant. Um, and by the way, if, and, uh, if people do have questions, I will be looking at the questions, Paul. So if you do have questions that are relevant to yeah, what Gary is discussing, then uh, just put it in and I'll make sure that uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss it here. Sorry, Gary. Yeah, look, and, and looking at the audience, you know, obviously, as expected, I suppose, there's a 
big proportion of trainers and consultants here. And, you know, since training is really what we're aiming for at the end of the day here, I think this is all to do with properly understanding where COVID fits in and where it can be helpful. And obviously through the training, trying to make sure people have understood that. Um, but my first, so my first question or first issue is to do with IT governance, which is the sort of, with COVID-5 in particular, the thing that uh, most people associate COVID with. I still think IT governance is not the best understood topic in itself. But, um, but what kind of frustrates me a lot about the COVID um, application of COVID and the way IT governance is perceived is this focus on risk and compliance. Now, not to say risk and compliance isn't important, but I don't feel that's the primary driver. And, uh, and it tends to lead towards more of a grudge kind of reaction to adopting COVID. It's to reduce audit findings or to reduce compliance issues as opposed to um, adding value. Um, so, you know, no enterprise that I've ever been to exists purely to manage risk. It's obviously there to deliver useful results to its stakeholders. And Corinne, if you go to the next slide, um, this diagram from, from COVID is probably the cornerstone of COVID-5's thinking, which is that governance is all to do with creating value. And it's not just about risk, and it's primarily to do with realizing benefits. And this thinking comes from Val IT, which was incorporated into, into COVID-5. So it's just one of those areas that I feel ought to be emphasized a lot from a COVID-5 perspective um, and helps management see the benefit of COVID and indeed the benefit of good governance and therefore the benefit of uh, applying these good practices. So that's the first so-called mistake. If we go to the second, the next one, Corinne. Um, and look, this is a common weakness I find everywhere where it doesn't matter whether the steering committee is to do with a project or a program or security or service levels or whatever. Too often I find that the constituents of these steering committees are the technical guys rather than the business end users. And, you know, it ends up becoming a service provider driven um, decision mechanism as opposed to the customer, the business owner taking the driving seat. And, you know, if we don't have the key stakeholders engaged properly, then we will never get, I think, the value that we need and even the outcome that we want or what, what the customer wants. Um, on the next slide, COVID from a, uh, from a COVID point of view. This is the management framework process in COVID. So this diagram is the other management processes in COVID. We haven't shown the governance processes, um, but that's fine. The, the ones I'm referring to here are all management processes. And if you're not familiar with um, this diagram, if you're new to COVID, this is the landscape you could say of all the processes that COVID covers from a management perspective. Um, and the management framework process is the one that is to do with organizing how management plays its role. Um, and obviously I can't today go through all the detail of this, but there's a lot of value in the COVID material from a roles perspective through RACI charts. And one of the interesting facts with COVID is that all of the accountabilities are business accountabilities. So there might be one that's a technical accountability, but all of the accountabilities are business owned. And, uh, and so this kind of demonstrates the need for the customer or the business to, to take ownership, um, or whether it's a steering committee or any other decision making body. So that's the second mistake. The third one, Corin, if you go to that one, is a little bit like the first one, which is the, you know, we only need to use all, uh, need COVID or we only need to improve ourselves because someone has found a weakness or found a finding, uh, typically audit findings. The whole mentality of being reactive rather than proactive. Um, it's very frustrating because it always ends up with a negative spiral, people pointing fingers at, fingers at one another. Um, even audit findings are not particularly valuable either because they often don't go to the root cause. So it's not a really value adding exercise to only approach things in that manner. Um, at the end of the day, it's management's job to improve the way um, a business runs itself and the application of the COVID good practices and indeed any other good practice, whether it's ITIL, project management, PM bot prints to whatever. If it's not driven by management taking ownership and being proactive, I don't think we'll ever get continuous improvement actually taking place. So if you go to the next slide, this is the monitoring process. In fact, I've just been working this morning on this process for one of my clients and, uh, and the whole idea is to drive a process of management ownership for this. Uh, you know, so management take the initiative, auditors are second line and the external auditors are kind of third line. Um, 
and this becomes a much more positive application of, uh, of good practice as well as you know, use of the COVID materials. Let's go to the fourth one. So this is, you know, a very topical topic, information security, and I suppose cyber security in particular has become the, I think almost every day I get three or four emails on cyber security. And, it, and obviously cyber security is a major concern. But I find that you know, information security, in particular cyber security, is another example of something that's very technical, um, very badly understood, communication very complex, um, and too often business management take the view that, well, I've, I've hired a security manager, you know, I've hired a security expert, therefore I don't need to do anything else. And my security expert you know, has gone on a training class or you know, he's followed some particular best practice, therefore I presume he knows what he's doing. Um, in my experience, it never works properly. The investments are never oriented towards the right things. Too often it's only a technical um, solution that's thought through, whereas a lot of the issues to do with every aspect of security, in particular cyber security, is the behavior of people and, the, and even the behavior of the enterprise, and sometimes even the behavior of a country. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I think it should be owned by and driven by the customer, the user, in terms of agreeing the investments and agreeing the, where the risks really lie and agreeing what action should be taken. So if we go to the next slide, in the COVID um, context, this is the management of security process, which is aligned with the ISO 27000 way of thinking. So it's, we've separated in COVID-5. It took a long time to agree this. I don't know why we never did it before. but in COVID-5, the management of security is separated from the operation of security, which is the old DS5, now DS05. So managing security is agreeing a security plan based on risk and based on an investment decision and based on management's accountability for taking those decisions, guided by technical people and everyone else. Um, and uh, you know, when that is applied, we get a totally different approach. And it's another one of the processes I'm currently working on, funny enough. Hey, Gary. So that's the fourth one. Uh, yeah. Perhaps the, uh, and thanks everyone for sending in the questions that, um, uh, that you sent before the weekend. And one question was from Eric, and he asked uh, the relationship with COVID and cybersecurity. Perhaps you can answer that question already. Yeah, I get, well, look, I've probably alluded to that already. I think. Well, there is, there is in COVID, there is a, a framework for cyber security that ISACA decided to align with, which is from NIST in the US. So that provides uh, you know, another example of good practices based on NIST's framework. But I think the power of COVID, as I've been saying, is that we can connect the importance of security to top management. So the whole COVID approach is to drive down from the top and to demystify what we're saying and what we think needs to be done. And so if we get management to appreciate the nature of the risks and the nature of the um, things that ought to be done to minimize cyber or any other security risk, then we've got a much better chance of actually adopting and implementing something that's going to work. That, so that's the value I see from COVID. I don't think really COVID will ever be positioned and certainly isn't at the moment positioned to go down to the detail of what needs to be done. That's covered by security best practices and security standards. What the benefit of COVID is that it brings the topic to the top management's table in a way they hopefully can understand and then have a dialogue about. Okay, so should we go, let's go to the fifth one then. So this is more moving towards service levels and service management and I guess ITIL. So a service level agreement, you know, is supposed to be the agreement with the customer of what the customer needs. But how often do we find service level agreements described in the service provider's language and in fact sometimes even laid on the table by the service provider um, without any even consideration of what the requirement is almost like a standard template um, the danger here is that the customer doesn't actually drive the agreement of what he wants the service provider may not properly understand what the outcome is that the service provider needs to generate you know as a service um, and when it comes to monitoring the performance of the service level agreement, it tends to be a low level monitoring process. It tends to be monitoring the technicalities of that service as opposed to monitoring the fact that the outcomes have been provided. Um, 
And I think this can cause huge tension. In my experience with commercial contracts, this tends to lead to lots of uh, disagreements, um, can even lead to penalties being applied when perhaps they shouldn't have been applied because the whole interaction was never properly debated in the first place. Um, from a COVID point of view, so if we go on to COVID, on the next slide, Corinne. So COVID covers this in managing service agreements. This is based on ITIL, but it emphasizes where the accountability is really like. It's the customer who should always drive a service agreement. And it's the customer who should be signing off the service agreement because it should be, you know, describing the outcomes that the customer wants. Obviously, it's got to be accepted by and agreed with the service provider. But if, if you don't have that dialogue and you don't have an agreement between the two parties, then the probability of delivering the right service is bound not to happen. So, um, you know, it, it's a cause and effect situation. So if you have good service providers who are determined to please their customers and don't worry too much about or don't concentrate primarily on protecting their own service, then you get a much better positive relationship and a partnership where everyone agrees, you know, what needs to be delivered. Um, and just to mention again, with all these processes, the benefit I find with COVID is that it's kept at a simple level, it's in plain language, it's not technical, and it can be understood by people who are not experts. And if you get people who are not experts beginning to understand what they must do, you get a much better management of IT and of course, governance of IT eventually as well. And, and, and Gary, while so, we're, um, we've covered five now and we discussed that we would uh, look at all the 10 in the end, but actually uh, the go-to meeting can only contain five questions. So I would like to do it here um, and ask the audience of, of these five that we've covered, and perhaps it's also a good recap actually, um, to, yeah, to look at the items in the list and share with us which one do you particularly um, see when you're doing training or consulting. So let me launch this one. Uh, number one through five. So, and I had to, if you can see, I had to be somewhat creative with um, answering or putting the text in because it didn't quite fit, but I believe everybody got it. So we'll take some time. So first one is assuming governance of IT is only related to risk and compliance. The second one, second, let's say, yeah, mistake uh, is not appointing the right stakeholders to IT steering committees. The third one is reacting only to audit findings. The fourth one is no senior business executive to drive management of information security. And the fifth one was defining SLAs and technical delivery terms. So those were the first five of the list of 10 that we'll share today. So some people are still voting. And by the way, if you do have other related uh, mistakes um, that you that you see, you can also put them in as a question, and then we'll cover those. So about half has voted. People are still voting, so I'll give it a couple more seconds. All right. I will close the poll in a second. Close. Which one do you actually, Gary? Which one do you think will be the winner? Any idea? Oh, God, I, no, no. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, I'll close it now, and I'll share the results. So you want to interpret this, Gary? Hmm. Well, I'm really pleased with the, the first one. Actually, I wasn't expecting that because okay. I'm I'm someone who you know the GRC combination I think is is a shame. Governance risk compliance. Um, so that's interesting. Okay. Oh, that's so you're good. Good. somewhat happy with the result then? Yeah, at least uh, there's some agreement with me. That's a good sign. <laughs> okay, good. I'm, I'm surprised about the 24% and number five. I thought this would be more. Okay. Yeah. All right. And we'll have another uh, recap at the end so um, of the other five. So I'll close this one. And then we'll move on to the next one thanks guys cool so look the next few are more to do with IT projects or IT programs and um, this is a real kind of hobby horse of mine for it's been for a long time and it and the thinking behind this has also come out of the Val IT thinking so those of us who who got onto this topic we, we decided we would never ever use the term IT project ever again because um, we believe there is no such thing and 
because projects that get enabled by IT get called IT projects, they end up becoming focused on an IT solution rather than what this solution is supposed to achieve for us. Like, you know, um, I don't know, so many, projects, so many projects are named after the actual application. And when that happens, I find that the whole thing is driven by the technology, it's driven by um, the IT technical people and even the vendors, as opposed to, be, to be being driven by the business owners and the business users for whom these projects are meant to be delivering some outcomes that are useful. Um, so, so, so be yeah. interested in what you guys think. So would you, uh, yes. would then instead of saying uh, CRM implementation or SAP implementation, would you call it uh, Project Gotham or w what would you name the project? No, you, you, it should be, it should, <laughs> it should be, so if you have, uh, well, let's take a, an easy one to understand. So a PeopleSoft project should really be an HR um, improve. It should, the title should be a summary of what the thing is meant to be achieving. Mm, okay. Yeah. yeah, good point. And I, I've had, I can give you countless examples where I found that the IT projects, get called SAP project, for example, the owner of the project is often not the business sponsor or the, we don't even have a business sponsor usually. There's the, the business owners aren't coming to the table because they see it as a technical project for the IT guys. Mm -hmm. um, the vendors see this as a huge advantage because they can now drive SAP, and when I say vendor, I don't mean SAP, I mean the anyway. integrators. They can drive this as a massive integration project with hopefully loads of modifications to the package that gives them not only a huge income, but a never ending source of income because uh, it's always going to need to be maintained as a special solution. When, when it's called um, by the name of the business change, and if the rule and if the principle is that the business change has to be sponsored by a business owner, has to be driven by a business owner and steered yeah. by the business, the outcome is entirely different. Uh, so yeah. in the COVID way of thinking, we don't use the term IT project. We talk about IT enabled business changes or IT enabled initiatives or even IT investments that are for business change. Yeah, I thought, I thought when I when I when you shared the list with me of the ten, let's say common mistakes, and I read this one, I thought, wow, that's, and I actually mentioned that in the email. I thought, wow, that's a really, yeah, simple idea, uh, easy to execute, but so many people indeed just, yeah, put the also here with an entrepreneur. We recently had some projects, I should say, not IT. <laughs> it's hard to, to not say, it, but yeah, we actually had the name of um, of the solution that we were implementing. So I thought about that's it. And the thought, actually, that's yeah, and then somebody actually mentioned, because we were talking about it here, and somebody mentioned an additional thing perhaps, that you didn't mention, um, is if, if the project doesn't go so well, then everybody also remembers the technology, because it's, then it's like, then the technology is also jinxed. So in a way, it's uh, yeah, I thought yeah. a very yes. interesting one, like, huh, why didn't I think about this earlier? But here's the COVID um, uh, overview that, um, that we didn't discuss yet. Yeah, and Corinne and guys, look, and just to mention quickly, the same applies to anything. The same applies to COVID so-called projects. There is no such thing as a COVID project either. <laughs> you know, using COVID or an ITIL project or a PM bot project, you know, they're the tool that would help you achieve something. And if you haven't defined what the something is and you don't focus on that, it's the tail wagging the dog every time. And, and it's like self-justifying itself with no real purpose. So in the COVID way of thinking, we make a big difference distinction between programs and projects and the program management is derived from the Val IT thinking that was done, you know, in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's all to do with um, a program is a business outcome. There's no thought of the solution. It's just, we have to engage in something that would achieve an outcome that somebody would like to have somehow that ends up being fulfilled with a number of projects. And, um, and the other interesting thing is that, and I think the trend going forward is moving more and more in this direction, that it's less and less technical work, it's more and more business change work. And we, we, can, you know, we don't need to change most of these applications. Most of them are already available. If we just resist the need to change the application, but change the business, we will have a far greater success rate, in my opinion. Now, you know, some of these subtle changes in attitude are huge, big wins. Yeah. But 
Corinne, you know, you mentioned what the words you said just before, but but I find it's not rocket science to do these changes. It's big changes in people's thinking and attitudes. That's the biggest obstacle to what everything COVID is about, is getting people to think in a different manner, you know, and getting the business guys to come to the table. So anyway, that one is driven off the, the program management side of um, what's called BAI01. Um, we go to the seventh one, which kind of the next few build on this. So I've already touched on this already. If we don't have a business owner or a business sponsor, then I don't think you could ever get a successful outcome of, a, of an, any investment initiative. If you're going to spend money and resources on something and it's not owned by the people who, who have the biggest stake in the pie, you know, the ones who want the thing to be successful, then the danger is you don't get any buy-in to anything, you know, whether it's the original business case or even a particular requirement description. If the, if the owners of this initiative are not engaged, how on earth can you deliver something that's likely to work, you know? Um, and it happens at every level. If you take it in, you know, I've got a guy actually working here at home just now, a carpenter, building me something outside. It's the same at every level. If you don't engage with whoever it is that you want to help you, and you take the driving seat of explaining what you want and being there all the way through to help that person produce something that you'll be satisfied by, well, it's no surprise if it doesn't work, you know. <laughs> And I think, you know, the vast majority of project failures can be, a, 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 you know, associated with these kinds of failures. It's very rarely the technical solution. It's, it's all the stuff up front. So, can we go to the next slide? This is the same, um, the same process. It's still managing programs and projects. It's a very valuable, imp the pro managing programs and project process in COVID-5 is far better than it was in COVID-4 particularly the program management. Um, and it, look, and even, again, we haven't got the time today to get into this, but there's a lot of misunderstanding, misunderstanding of what a program is versus what a project is. A program isn't just a lot of projects. It's totally separate. It's, um, it's the thing that defines what the outcome needs to be and how an out outcome is actually proven to have been delivered. But maybe that's for another day. <laughs> um, let's go to the next one, which, you know, it's, it's probably a, one of the old chestnuts I've always, I've, I've been working with IT for too long to even mention. Um, and I would argue that in all my life working with IT, I have never found a so-called requirement specification, which is actually a requirement specification. They're always, in my experience, a description of the functional solution that someone wants you to have. You know, a requirement salute definition should be, um, not what the solution is, but what the solution needs to meet as a requirement. It's a, a big difference. We use the word outcome a lot in COVID. And in the, if you go to the, um, the next slide, Corin, this is the managed requirement definition process, BAI02. In, in the build part of COVID, there is no, you know, description of, of development methods or whether it should be waterfall or agile or anything like that. That's not really the point. The point is that you have to have a program properly established and, a, and the projects. The requirements ought to be expressed in outcome language, signed off and driven by the user who wants this solution. And then we should create a solution that meets those needs completely, which COVID-5 is much better than COVID-4 in the sense that it includes business process change as well as the technical changes, because that's the way more and more the future is heading. Um, less building of technical solutions, more buying in and renting and even using cloud solutions that are off the shelf, but changing the way we do our business. So that's the eighth one. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, quick, uh, we have a question that came in, it uh, might be from the previous yep. one, but John asks, uh, Enterprise X has many data governance initiatives. How do we fit data issues into COVID? Thanks for the question, John. So can you say that again? Yeah, Sorry. so what if an enterprise has many data governance initiatives? Uh, how do you fit data issues into COVID? So I assume the question from John, but let me know if it's different, is how do you use COVID if there's yeah, data yeah. issues? How do you solve those with COVID? That's a, good, that's a good question. Let's leave this slide up because this is the architecture topic, in my opinion. And 
you know, it took a while to get enterprise architecture into COVID. It was in COVID four, there was a bit of reluctance because it was maybe a bit of a new thing at that time. Um, we had information architecture in COVID four, but you know, arch enterprise architecture for me is the big thing at the moment, I, and can make such a difference if it's used effectively. So understanding information and understanding data and how information is linked to you know, applications, services and business processes is probably one of the biggest challenges and how to leverage that information to be productive and value adding you know, for an enterprise. And that is best driven through a good enterprise architecture way of thinking. You know, so again, it's a bit difficult to cover that in two seconds today, but um, funny enough is one of the next workshops I'm working on as a new training, training um, opportunity, how to get enterprise architecture into the minds of the non-architects. Mm. It's, it's what, one of my co constant themes is that is the frustration that um, the, the masses don't understand the experts. You know, <laughs> um, what we've got to do is get the ex the non-experts to appreciate these good practices in a way they would understand, so they can drive and use them. Mm. Um, and architecture is a good example. So I hope that answers John's question. But um, Thanks, Gary. And then one question from Susan uh, on this one, actually. Uh, it's, uh, she says, so basically a testable requirement. Is that what you meant with, um, with this previous one? Sorry, with, um, if, we, if we put this one up. Yeah. Do you mean like, yeah, a testable requirement? I don't have a testable requirement. It, 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 a re There's a difference between an outcome and a solution. So, you know, an outcome would be, I need something that will allow me to do the following, whatever it might be. Okay. In my training, sometimes, to think about something entirely different, I, I, was just re I used to refer to the, the World Cup, because in South Africa, that was a good, a good little local topic, you know, from 2010. So, and, and living in Cape Town, the football stadium. The outcome is, we've got to have a football stadium ready by a certain date, that will support the World Cup, that meets all the things that FIFA say they must have, that is possible to fund and possible to maintain as a as a uh, viable solution thereafter, somehow, okay? In the end, that becomes a whole series of projects. Some of them are construction projects, some of them are nothing to do with construction, but to do with the whole um, commercial operation of the whole thing, you know? Um, and in our experience locally, like it has been in most countries, 80% um, of it was very successful. The World Cup was a huge success. The stadium was built on time. It was fantastic. You know, since then, it's been a big debate as to what we're going to do with this thing. Yeah. Um, so what I'm trying to say is with IT driven, you know, IT is just the enabler. We've got to describe what it is we want these, this enabler to do for us that would be value added. That's the requirement. But typically, the requirement definition that the business is asked to sign off is a description of the, the functionality that's being proposed as the technical solution. I could go on and on, unfortunately, with this, so I don't have the time. But yeah, uh, <laughs> so we, correct because we also need yeah. to get um, yeah some of the COVID behind the numbers let's say or behind the COVID numbers but let's uh yeah let's wrap up to 10 and then statement will continue so look, number nine we've actually probably covered already because it's uh it's not just the question of using it project as the focus but naming them after the it solution it's just a recipe for disaster in my opinion yeah. um like like you were saying uh, the sap project no one would do that in anything in any other environment it's, i don't know why we've always done it when it comes to it or technology um so maybe we can skip that one. It's back again to the managing programs and projects. Yeah. We talk about IT investments. We talk about IT enabled initiatives, and we talk about the name being what it's meant to achieve. And then the last one, which is the, you know, the whole life cycle of investment. So one of the great um, values that came from the Val IT initiative, which was extremely well done, but didn't get adopted as well as it might have been, I think partly because we had another framework as well as COVID and partly because it was probably seen to be perhaps too advanced and too complicated. So the decision in COVID-5 was to move all the Val IT thinking into COVID and not carry on with Val IT any longer and to express it 
at the normal level of COVID. So it's at the high level of uh, what to do in plain language. And the whole thinking around this was driven from investment management thinking. In fact, it was driven originally from, uh, well, Corey, you know the Dutch bank ING, um, which became a global bank. They actually drove this initially themselves and that led on to ISACA and adopting a lot of the thinking. It was the investment bankers who kind of guided the thinking here. And the thinking is simply that everything we do costs time and money, so we should adopt an investment way of thinking. If we invest in something, there should be a return, and, um, and that return should be beneficial to the stakeholders. And the key document or the key um, mechanism for ma managing all of that is the so-called business case. If you look at all the analysts' research reports and just the experience that perhaps people have had in, in practice, business cases are rarely done properly when it comes to IT investments. And when they are done, they tend to be forgotten. In um, a program management process, the business case is the key document. So the business case, program management is basically dealing with business cases and making sure the business case has delivered, or we've delivered what the business case promised. So a program lasts for the full life cycle of the investment. And in fact, the benefits don't arrive until, or don't even begin to arrive until all the projects have been finished. Go back to the football stadium, you know, the day it opens is when you start measuring the benefits of that football stadium. Or if it's a new store, a retail store, the day the store opens is when you start to measure, are anyone buying anything from this store? Unfortunately, with IT projects, everyone disappears when the IT projects are finished and no one seems to care about, you know, the success of that initiative. So um, I think it's a huge mistake that people are making. They do not focus on the benefits that well, first of all, they don't, they, don't, they don't describe the promises, they don't describe the benefits properly in the original business case, and they don't set up a method of monitoring and measuring those benefits thereafter. In the COVID way of thinking, there are several processes actually that pick this up, and it's all to do with um, benefit realization and what COVID calls a value management office that sits on top of a project management office. So look, they're the 10 that I, from my experience, I just see, see as, uh, the most serious weaknesses, let's say, but also where I feel the greatest benefits can be gained. So it's not just, I've been trying to pick things where I think if you do the right thing, you get some huge improvements. And it's, by the way, it's, it's funny that you closed off with the last one. And while I uh, tell this story, I'll open up the, um, the poll here on my second computer. So if we can just, um, yeah, we've had six to 10 now. If you can just, yeah, which one do you encounter often? Uh, then I'll let you vote and then um, uh, actually Gary the first the, my first ever well my second perhaps real job was with a startup and what we did was um, we supported organizations based on Val IT with uh, IT project selection so our our audience was let's say CIOs and the IT directors but when I joined um, the, the start the founder said that told me like well you know well, here's what we do blah blah and, he, and I, I asked, like, well, but don't they have, like, business cases to select projects based on, yeah, the outcome? Um, because he said, yeah, if you have, let's say, 2,500 projects requested in a big organization and you can only prove 500, which one do you pick? That was the challenge that we helped uh, overcome. And uh, But he told me, he's like, yeah, for this, there's usually no business cases. And, yeah, then you think, then you're talking about large organizations. And I was a little bit shocked as a newbie that there was no business case for many of these. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say projects. I should say projects, uh, IT projects. I should say projects. Sorry, Gary. Um, anyway, that's, that's a little intimate. So here, 50%, uh, uh, over 50% voted. So I'll manage to poll, close it, and then uh, Stefan uh, will get ready. We'll warm up. And some of the slides, sorry, by the way, some of the... Um, uh, uh, some of the questions I can't actually answer because of time. So I'll close this one. I'll share it with you. Hmm. So, any comments, mm -hmm. Stefan, Gary? Oh, that's good. I, well, I like that last one being high because that, for me, that is a crucial one. Yeah. yeah that was actually clicking on it for 10 times. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting results. It's. Uh, uh, 
And I wonder, like, naming IT projects after the solution, if not a lot of people see it as a problem or if they don't um, encounter it often as a mistake, perhaps, because I would assume that it happens a lot. So that's, I uh, find that an interesting one. All right, I'll close this one. I'd, um, here we go. And then specifically for Amat, he asked, can you please bring out the slide, this one, for a couple seconds? So I'll do that. So I hope this, um, and this actually helps you. Perhaps you can take a screenshot of this one. I count to three, and then it will go, Amat. One, two, three. All right. Um, oh, one slide from my side, actually. Uh, forgot I put this one in. Um, just to explain why uh, we're doing this webinar, and Gary is, is the author of all of our COVID courses, and um, the reason that we work with Gary is that he is really the man behind COVID. He's been yeah, using COVID for a very, very long time, uh, also has been a COVID author for, for many years, and that, let's say that knowledge is put into the content, so we don't just cover the exam, and that's the first bullet on the top, but we also cover the practicality of actually using COVID in real life. So that's yeah, where we differentiate our training materials from some of the others. Um, well, quality, Gary is the author and architect. I kind of mentioned that already. Uh, yeah, and in the past, we really worked with um, many of the developers of COVID. And we actually, as entrepreneurs, we developed the first ever COVID course uh, back in, ooh, when was that, 2003, perhaps? 2002, five? I think. Two. Um, yeah. So yeah, long history with the COVID and still one of my personal favorite projects. Um, Stefan, it's all up to you for some COVID stats and information. Yeah, <clears throat> and many thanks, Gary, for for giving that that kind of an overview. Uh, I couldn't agree more <laughs> on the ten topics you mentioned. Um, so I mean, most of us know uh, probably uh, you know APMG when you're involved in any kind of training and for getting accredited as a trainer. Um, um, so basically, we can skip this part. Um, um, and we are, we are just made one mention that we have been uh, just also because of our um, uh, certifications that we have on the on, on the ISO standards have been appointed by ISACA basically four years ago for uh, running the accreditation examination scheme for COVID-5. So on the next slide, what I'm, I just have two bullet points um, that I want to share with you. Um, so first question is, what is the market take up? So just to give you an insight of how did the market react so far since uh, we have launched COVID-5 examinations in, uh, in 2012. And the second one is, and this is really for selling, what does it mean for training organization end users? So the market take up is not just about um, exam numbers and figures, it's also about how did, did um, uh, organization legislation regulations um, react on the fact that COVID is there. So there are, and this is on the next slide, separate views on the benefits of COVID-5. So the initial demand really has come from, um, from let's say, the auditor's perspective, because this is what, where previous to COVID-5, this was basically the scheme. And I myself, I was certified in COVID-4 um, um, at that time. Um, so we saw, very much take up, um, um, in particular from, from these kind of community. Um, but if you look at the COVID-5 framework, and Gary has, has uh, basically given an overview uh, on, on, on the different areas there, uh, this is too short of a jump. So there is a second view, um, which is on the next slide, um, which is increasingly coming from a wider management perspective. I mean, there was this example about uh, that, that a project is called an IT project, SAP project. Basically, nobody is running SAP for the sake of having SAP. And I'm not doing a particular marketing here. It might be, and this is a stakeholder thing, that those who need SAP or, or need this IT project are those who want to um, double the number of receipts or bookings they can do. So it should be a booking improvement project. So I absolutely agree with Gary, and we've seen this a lot. Increasingly, that's the good news, there's more and more awareness about these things. And that's why we say the surface still hasn't been scratched. And there are some of the benefits uh, exactly in that area to look at COVID-5, not just from an auditor's perspective. So if you 
if you look at the next slide, you will see this is not about controls. And one of the key things that COVID, or key elements that COVID is promoting is it's actually a um, holistic approach to manage frameworks. Or in other word, it's the framework to manage other frameworks. And we've seen this, that there is always the, the, the management and the governance area that is covered in the different elements of COVID, but never how you do it really. Um, that is covered by ITIL or on its certification areas by ISO 20000. On project can be prints to any kind of agile method you can think of, PM book, Six Sigma. Um, this is where COVID basically puts it all together under one roof. Now, on the next slide, I want to uh, share you. Stefan, one quick um, question. Yeah. Um, because we did have um, a question come in on ITIL and COVID, and I thought I'd let me just develop a poll from this one. Since we yeah. also do a lot of ITIL, um, uh, like a lot of yeah, sure. ITIL materials are, um, uh, a lot of our partners do ITIL. So I just figured, do you use COVID together with ITIL? And then you can say yes, no, uh, or sometimes. Just a quick vote to see um, yeah, how many of you actually use it together. And then we'll quickly move on to the slides again. And by the way, I see some questions coming in. Um, if we have time at the QA, then we'll definitely cover those. Mm -hmm. So I'll hide the poll now, I'll close it, uh, share. So yes, no, sometimes. So <laughs> a little bit all over the place. Uh, so I guess the majority does use it. Um, if you take the yes and the sometimes together. So maybe that's, uh, yeah, just in relation to when you brought up that slide, I figured I could put this one in uh, safe home. So mm. but, uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, next one, please. Yeah. So the approximately 35,000 exams have been taken um, since 2012 worldwide. And as you can see, this all started around November, December 2012, where the first uh, training organization actually went into business for COVID-5, got accredited. There was a huge take up in the beginning. It then, it then stabilized, but it has different variations in different countries. So in some of them, it, it has actually gone down a bit when all the auditor way was uh, was gone through, and in other areas, some legislation, some regulations, some le regula regulatory uh, approaches have been taken. Um, so you see more growth there. On the next slide, and this is might might be interesting for you, um, I have just uh, elaborated which countries, um, and I'm just taken those where there are more than thousand exams have been taken since 2012 where there was the biggest take up of COVID. So you see um, a big slices in the USA, in South Africa, in India, in Latin America, in the UK. And uh, MIP stands for Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and, and Mexico, and the Middle East. So this is interesting um, how global COVID-5 actually has become in the meantime. And there's a good reason for that, because some um, countries, some regions actually have used or have recognized COVID. And there is no framework um, so far in the, in, in, the, in the management and IT governance area that's so much recognized than COVID is. If you just look at ITIL or PRINCE2, it never really has been mandated anywhere as a best practice. But well, we see actually some man man mandate or mandates um, and by COVID. So on the next slide, I mean, heading up with, um, uh, or starting with the US, um, the US have referenced COVID in the uh, US cybersecurity framework, and it also has been acknowledged uh, by the Department of Defense for Homeland Security Governance. And since then, we have seen more and more um, training happening, more courses happening in the US, um, as there's more interest now to actually understand um, how to use COVID in, in, in these environments. Um, another one is uh, where it has been uh, recognized is in Australia and in South Africa, um, which is different. So in Australia, it's uh, recognized and recommended by the Australian National Audit Office as a baseline for controls. So you're better off to use it there. And in South Africa, they even have, begun, have gone a bit further as it's adopted by national directive requ and required by more than 150 government departments. So that might explain why there's more take up in South Africa as we maybe would expect. 
Um, we have then um, in the in the United Arabic Emirates, um, it is used by all government institutions for financial audits. And you can also see, if you look at the ISACA website, you find actually um, a case study about how the Dubai customs are using COVID in some areas, which is very interesting to, re to read. In India, it's the Reserve Bank, the Security Exchange Board, um, who are using COVID-5. In Brazil, it is the control work for the central bank in Brazil. And if you continue, then you have um, in, the, in the European Union, um, which is on the next slide, um, it is used by European Court of Audit in the performance of its audit and IT governance. Um, reviews, and that has even started before COVID-5 arrived. So that is around for a while. Um, I, I, I've been to Turkey before, a couple of years ago, when I, when I learned that it actually had been mandated by banking regulation and supervision agency for all banks in the country, um, which is a trend um, that we've seen, um, that wherever there is some kind of regulation missing, in particular after the crash in uh, 2008, um, where more regulations were needed, um, actually COVID-5 COVID was used for that and COVID in general. And what I didn't mention here is how much COVID is used in Russia, which you wouldn't believe, uh, and in some other areas. Um, so as a summary, um, if you want to adopt or want to make sure that as a training and, and uh, consulting company, um, where will it will sell best or can be adopted and adapted? Um, probably where idle is in a mature stage. So an organization that is just simply using idle for managing the service desk, I wouldn't call that a mature stage. Um, coming back to Gary's example about SLAs, um, organizations that have understood that they have to define SLAs, not from a technical point of view, but from a requirements point of view, uh, and from an achievement measurable, they are probably are much more um, mature. And ITIL is giving a lot of guidance on how to actually do um, service level agreements. Also in those areas where regulation gaps need to be filled, and Turkey was one of those, probably a lot of, lot of this is also in, in Northern Africa and the Middle East and some Eastern European countries. It is well fit where government standards match and where organization maturity is high. And where probably also too many frameworks are causing confusion. So organizations that have said, we do error project with Scrum, we do all this with that, and then there is a big zoo of different animals um, that are hard to feed. Um, this is where you actually can, can probably gain more management attention using COVID-5 as kind of a solution to start trying to get this all more or less under control. So being adopted the right way, um, which is my closing slide here, um, that actually is the answer to, um, to, to more growth for COVID-5 uh, for you as a, as a training and consulting company. Um, so it is, I think, one of the most advanced frameworks that exist um, because it sit on top of each other and I haven't seen anything um, that has that power of uh, managing ITIL or IT for IT or whatever is used in organizations to get the chair shareholder value, which was one of the first uh, topics that uh, Gary mentioned today. So many thanks and I'm sure open for questions. Thanks, Stefan. And, um... Uh, I have good news and bad news. The good news is that um, we actually finished the talking sessions before uh, before the end of the hour. The bad news is that we I have some questions still here in the chat box, which we can't answer all of them, but I'll just kind of pick a couple and then maybe for the ones that, that um, don't have the time, then yeah, they can drop off. And uh, I will say thank you for, um, uh, yeah, for joining this webinar with us uh, today. And if you have questions, yeah, feel free to send them. Uh, I will send the recording and the slides. So if you want to drop off now, then uh, appreciate the time in uh, spending today with us, uh, with Gary and Stefan, and um, look forward to being in touch. So that was for the one who left, for the one who are staying. Uh, thanks, Leslie, for um, liking the content. Uh, we have one question, and Gary, we, we discussed that already because somebody else uh, emailed us. It's, I see ITIL and COVID-5 doing the same thing. How are they different? So I believe you're writing a... 
uh, you've, uh, you've written a publication, perhaps you can say something about that. Uh, Gary is muted, probably. Yeah. Oh, lovely. There you go. <laughs> right. Sorry. Yeah. yeah no, no worries. I'm back on. No worries. Yeah. So there is a there is an Axelos publication that came out at the beginning of this year called Interfacing and Adopting um, ITIL and COBIT, which I authored. So I'd encourage you to get that book because it it really Stop. demonstrates the benefit of you know two plus two equals five. If you put I, COVID on top of ITIL. Adopt COVID and ITIL. It's interfacing and adopting ITIL and COVID. So it's on the Axelos and uh, you know the best practices um, um, websites. The Axelos. Uh, okay, I'm just typing in here. Send to all. There we go. So that's the best way to find out. Yeah, thanks. They're very complimentary. And by the way, we also I oh, um, sorry, uh, Andrea. Um, you can also Google ITIL COVID. Uh, IT entrepreneurs, because I do know that we have some presentations or blog posts about that topic. Um, and then a question for Stefan. And, and, and Corey, maybe, sorry, yeah. Corey, just to quickly mention, of course, and we created a, it's just about to be launched, um, a one day work strategy, like strategy workshop based on that book, which would be part of the COVID portfolio, uh, an ITIL portfolio in IT entrepreneurs. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> And then one was from uh, uh, Ronald. He asked, how do we apply COVID in an agile environment? It's more of a yeah, practitioner question, but still relevant for, yeah, for here. Um, I think, it, although everybody would maybe consider this being a contradiction, um, uh, coming from a compliance control view and then have agile, it actually is not necessarily. I, I would like to have a more detail about that question because I mean, COVID um, it was controlling frameworks. I mean, if you look at, at, let's say, agile development being in a hamster box, yeah, so where developers are delivering outcome, some kind of delivery products, yeah, this needs to be managed so that there's still budget available and and everything that's needed. Um, this is for, for Scrum, for example. This is not very typical. Um, um, so you need some kind of a framework above that anyway. I think for a fast product delivery, um, this is where you need agile in organizations. Yeah? So it plays very well, although Kobe doesn't tell you how do you actually, or which one to use. It doesn't even say it has to be Scrum or Agile PM or whatever. It doesn't even say that. Um, but it clearly says that there has to be a business outcome, a business achievement. So I think every framework that's just doing project for the sake of the framework is wrong here. Hmm. Gary? Yeah, yeah Stefan, maybe just to add that there was a very good, in the Val IT thinking, John Thorpe, who was the, the guru behind this, he had, uh, he talked about the so-called four R's and the two that are most relevant are doing the right thing for the right benefit. Now, you know, we're all, I think everyone likes the idea of Agile. It's not a new idea either, by the way. We've had prototyping for as long as anyone can remember. But, but it's, it's a real shame if we do Agile development of the wrong thing for the wrong benefit. Yeah. It's yeah. just a fast track to the wrong result, you know. And that's where COVID comes in. COVID will, if you apply COVID properly, you'll get management taking ownership of making sure we, in an Agile way, create the right outcome for the right benefit. Um, and Agile will be doing it in the right way. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Nice. And then, um, thanks, I hope, uh, Ronald, that answers the, uh, the question. Um, then, I, considering the time, looking here, 5 o'clock exactly in my time. Um, one question here for Stefan uh, from John. It's like, when I last looked, it appeared to be difficult for a student to register for a COVID-5 foundation exam after self-study. Is APMG doing anything to make the exam registration easier to find? Uh, and what are APMG and ISACA doing to promote COVID through local ISACA chapters? Um, well, very good question. So first of all, <clears throat> I'm not aware that there were difficulties in, uh, in setting a COVID exam after self-study because it's on the APMG website. You find it and it actually is also referenced on the ISACA website to get there. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of any difficulties that recently have. You know, this, there's the version for virtual proctor where people can take a virtual proctored exam. 
actually quite straightforward okay. to find it. Oh, it says um, APMG. Maybe. Yeah, John is from the US. He says APMG USA. So but I don't know if that makes a difference. Well, it's a, cent it's, it's a central AP on, it's on the central APMG side. Okay. Um, I think when we when we do the kind of Q and A section where we can I can, can include the link. Um, um, so maybe that that should help. Okay. Uh, so that was the first one. What was yeah. the second? The second you know, one. What, what are APMG and ISACA doing to promote uh, COVID through ISACA chapters? Well, we're working with ISACA chapters, um, and and this is on has different stages uh, of maturity. So there are some chapters, and I, I know in Southern Europe. Um, and also know in the US uh, where we actually working closer together. This the point is that some Isaka chapters actually have chapter trainers who promote, and some don't. Um, so the way chapters work in the world, and Isaka chapters are set up, and the way they work is very very different. Um, so it's not very consistent. Yeah. Uh, we're usually helping and open for for support to um, to to chapters. Some are very very active. Um, and I think more and more have understood that there is an opportunity for for Isaka chapters to drive COVID-5. But when I just come back uh, to what has been said before, yeah, Isaka is also a membership organization mainly from coming from the auditor's perspective. Um, so there's this is COVID, and it also there's a lot of COVID-4 still there. Um, and we talk when we're talking about COVID-5. This is really more taken up by by uh, um, commercial companies um, who are much more in 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 consultant projects where they consult IT managers and C CEOs. Mm. Um, so it's not a surprise that you don't have the same kind of uh, promotional power from these soccer chapters. Yeah, and by the way, if John, if you have ideas on you know, what we, ITpreneurs, uh, APMG, ISACA, Gary, what we could do to support that, then uh, yeah, just shoot me an email, and then um, yeah, we'll, I'll share it with Stefan and Gary. More than happy to just, yeah, just to, think along. Yeah, Gary. Sorry, Corey. Just a quick, just a quick comment. Um, going back to Stefan's slides about the the national sort of situations, yeah. I'd say in all those cases. But most of the reasoning behind the, the reason most of that happened was because of the local chapters in those countries. Mm, yeah. um, there's been a lot of influence. The local chapters can actually do a lot to influence, um, you know, the local bodies and yeah. collaborate with, with other bodies. In ISACA, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that the chapters are where it happens, you know, and, and that's where we should focus. Um, it's like in any entity, you know, we've got a global reach that the local scenarios are variable, the local languages are variable, so everything to leverage chapters is a good thing. And um, yeah. maybe there's an action, Stefan, to think about in terms of um, just sharing with chapters um, the experiences you've just described, because um, I'm not sure all chapters are even aware, because some chapters are more capable than others because of their size, that's the other thing. Yeah. Um, well, we do. We actually speak to ch chapters, um, um, to a lot of chap chapters around the world. Um, but I agree with you. A lot, probably a lot of this uh, local regulations have been initiated by the chapters. By the way, I forgot to mention that there is a document on the ISACA website where this is even more in detail, um, um, and it's called the COVID Global Regulatory and Legislative Recognition. It's a four or five page document which you find on the Isaka website. I just took a couple of of examples out of that document. Um, um, so that might be interesting depending on the region where you are. Okay, good point. Well, then I'll, um, then I yeah, unfortunately have to close the webinar for today. Um, but every, all the questions that did came, that did come in, um, then yeah, we'll, uh, we'll discuss, we'll, basically answer those by email. I saw another one, Christopher, uh, coming in. So we'll close it now and follow up with, the, with some of the questions um, by email. So thanks again for joining today. Thank you, Stefan, for sharing your, um, yeah, the numbers behind COBE and also some of the, the trends and local initiatives. And uh, Gary, obviously, for uh, the top 10 common mistakes made by IT management, how to solve those with COBE. So thanks again. Have a great day, evening, depending on where you are, and look forward to seeing you on the next webinar. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Corin. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Corin, for hosting this. You're welcome. Okay.